Yeah, yeah, check one, two, check one, two. Is this mic on? Is this mic on? Hey, listen, man. It's the one and only Trent set of DJ Sense, and you're listening to Cocktails. Dirty Discussions with Kiki and Medina Monroe. Yeah. Today's cocktail is called Dick with No Complications. The ingredients you need are ice, triple sec, mezcal. I prefer Casamigos mezcal, but you pick your poison. Grenadine, lemonade, and this is how you're going to make it. So in a highball glass, you're going to pour the grenadine, stack the ice, followed by two shots of mezcal, triple sec, and top it off with lemonade. And enjoy. That's dick with no complications. <laughs> you know, I don't really like mezcal that much. I don't like that aftertaste. Really? I love I would smoky do it. smell. I mean, Mm-mm. smell and taste. Mm-mm. But I would switch it out for just another one of the Casamigos. It does sound good. Grenadine and lemonade and triple sec. Yum. Well, welcome back to Cocktails Dirty Discussions, you guys. I hope everybody's staying safe we do have a special guest with us today yes y'all we have janelle pierce the executive director of the sti project i have literally been trying to get her as a guest for i think over a year mm-hmm. yeah it's definitely been that long yes i'm so glad to finally <laughs> be here and our schedules have meshed for the first time and yeah literally mm-hmm. a year Yeah, thank God for the internet. Um, So she has, um, we're going to talk to her about a lot of stuff, but before we get into who you are and your story and everything like that, we're going to play a game. And this game is called This or That. So you'll just pick one of the two options and tell us about it. So you want to go first? Yeah. So the first one, Janelle Pierce, role play or be yourself? Be yourself. Hmm. And do I expand on that or say, like, why or add some context? I would like to know why. Yeah, tell us why. Yeah. You know, I've not done a lot of role play. And I know that's such a big, um, it's a big interest for a lot of folks. And I think, I think actually, to be quite frank, I role play a little bit in my head. Um, but I like the spontaneity of, of course, there's always like communication and a little bit of stuff of that communication beforehand as a sexual health educator, like, I'm, I'm a big like, let's talk about is this okay? And should we do this? And are you feeling okay? And all that mm-hmm. stuff. But mm-hmm. um, even so, even after the communication happens, like there's still, it just it just kind of happens as it happens in the pace that it's supposed to. So I like that. Mm-hmm. I like that. There's still some, um, it's not necessarily all planned. Like I'm a big planner. I'm super logical and analytical. And I have like mm-hmm. lists upon lists and all over the house. So I think I like that it's just the role play, you have to plan that out as well. So I like the non-planning aspect. <laughs> Kiki, would you okay. rather role play or be yourself? It depends on the mood. I feel you. Like maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'll be myself. And the other days, <laughs> I'll be somebody else. I don't know. It depends. Um, but I do think I probably am myself more than role play. Mm-hmm. Um, for play or get right to it. Oh, and this is so, you know, I'm going to totally be a bad educator and it's like, get right to it. So (laughs) I'm one of the very few people with a vulva vagina who does not really, is not that interested in foreplay. Like fingering's great, but oral, I could go without it entirely, which is for your whole life unusual. Yeah. If I had to give it up, I totally would. Like I'm a phallophile. So I love penises and like, I want the dick inside. (laughs) You're like, (laughs) stop playing. What you doing down there? I could not live without. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Isn't Next that funny? One? I know That's that is. Cool. Funny. I've never totally heard atypical. someone say that. Wow. I've heard. I've heard a few people say they're not really that into it, but not. I can't live without it. I mean, I can live without it. Wow. Whew. Okay. Next one. Mm-hmm. Lights on or off? Mostly on, but I, but off can be kind of fun every once in a while. Like I feel like when I was a lot younger, it was always lights off and that not being comfortable in my own skin and such and so Mm -hmm. now i like like to see like the body the penis like i'm i'm a um i'm heterosexual so my partners are almost always have been male or or people with penises anyways like i'm masculine centric Mm -hmm. and um yeah so yeah lights on for sure 
Hmm. Okay, learn something. Okay, phone sex, like on the phone talking, or sexting? Definitely sexting, 100%. Same. Same. And mm. I literally just started getting into it. It's just so much more fun. And you can, for me, it's easier to say the things I really want to say. Mm-hmm. And then the anticipation of the response and all of that. I, this morning, I was trying to figure out who I could send some videos to. <laughs> <laughs> see them little bubbles. That's okay. True. I love that. Mm-hmm. Like, and you know, what's funny about that, too, is. I'm not a big, I'm not audible and like words when I'm mm-hmm. sober, but if you give me a couple of cocktails, since we're, you know, this is cocktails, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm all of a sudden, I'm like dirty talking left and right, like you're going to do this and um, I get a different persona. So maybe that's an aspect of role play, like my personality changes a little bit. My husband mm-hmm. and I were just talking about that the other day and like how I'm a little bit different, quite a bit different in bed and like sometimes that can be good or sometimes it's way over the top. It just depends like how many drinks have I had kind of thing. <laughs> But Mm -hmm. that's exactly it because I'd rather like write it out and know what I'm going to say and things. And I don't, Mm -hmm. I'm not very witty. I've never been a witty person. So I don't know what to say right at the end of the moment. Hmm. Okay. Last one drunk sex or sober sex? Mostly sober. I would prefer, like, actually don't usually, I'm not usually able to orgasm um, if I am having drunk sex. Really? For so, me, it's the opposite. If I'm looking for like an actual mm. complete. Oh, really? Yeah. I can do it either way. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay. Three um, snaps to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So first, let me explain to our listeners why we wanted to get Janelle on so bad. One day I was just searching hashtags. Sometimes we just search hashtags to find guests. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to do an educational, this was back when we hadn't done one yet. And we mm-hmm. wanted to have like a doctor on or have someone come on and talk about STDs and all that stuff. And we just weren't finding the right fit. And then I came across Janelle's page mm-hmm. and she was literally celebrating her herpes anniversary. And I was just- On I, Instagram? On Instagram, okay. bro. And so I, I went to your page and I was like, this lady is crazy. No, she is not really <laughs> doing this. We have to get her on the show because I've never seen someone celebrate the the anniversary of when they contracted herpes yeah yeah what anniversary was it giant 20th it was the 20th anniversary so i'm 37 i contracted herpes when i was 16 years old super young and Mm -hmm. um yeah i bought myself a giant mylar balloon in in an h shape gold h and Mm -hmm. i got naked i got naked in my yard and took pictures all over and and like the h was just covering up the sensitive bits like of course nipples you know Mm -hmm. a band or female nipples or quote unquote female nipples are banned on instagram Mm -hmm. and then you know i i covered like the the vulva but um yeah pretty much (laughs) absolutely like naked like here I am I don't care I'm owning it and this is this is where I'm at and it to come full circle like it took me such a long time to be in this empowered place of like I don't it does not impact me in the way that most people would assume it does so I Mm -hmm. wanted to and then I had a lot of like pushback of are you celebrating that you have an STI STD like who does that Mm -hmm. and it's not that I have the infection like nobody wants an infection I still don't want another infection if I can help Mm -hmm. it I've also had scabies and HPV so I've had more than one STI like who admits that right Mm -hmm. says Mm -hmm. it out loud or anything that's actually quite common but yeah it's not that I've had the infection that I was celebrating it's I was celebrating that it no longer defines me and it no longer impacts my relationship my self-view my self-worth um how much i advocate for myself or don't you know none of those things it doesn't it doesn't relate to any of that anymore how long did it take you to get to that point it took a for me it took a long time because there really weren't any resources out there like this is you know 20 years ago and like yes we had the internet but it wasn't you know we didn't have as much social media like there wasn't facebook it just wasn't the the same kind of environment and it wasn't easy to find other people who were talking about it like I really felt super alone and I felt like I was the only one and now I know of course that that's entirely untrue and the vast majority of people contract an STI or STD at some point 
But I didn't know that. So I really thought like everything that you hear about people with STDs, they're dirty, they're slutty, trashy whores, damaged goods, promiscuous, Mm -hmm. cheaters, like all of the things. I -hmm. immediately thought like when I contracted it, this is me, then that's it. Then that's exactly who I am. That's what I am. That's what everyone's going to think about me. I'm never going to be able to have sex again. I'm never going to have a relationship, get married, have kids, whatever, any of those things. So yeah, for, for me, it took a long time. Um, probably into my like early 20s where I was finally Mm -hmm. like this doesn't add up it doesn't make any sense do you know you said that you contracted um herpes when you were 16 do you know who you contracted it from I know sometimes that's hard to like track do you know who you got it from that's a good question. Like, not everybody will answer it. For me, I actually don't know because I had been sexually active with more than one partner at that point in time. And I didn't have the, like, um, I guess, confidence. I was petrified of what if I asked the wrong person and, and then mm-hmm. they don't have it and it was the other person. And so now more people are going to know. And I absolutely was terrified of anybody finding out. And um, yeah, so I don't know. And it's a good question in that it's actually not so easy to to know who you contracted it from. A lot of people will assume like you first will get diagnosed with an STI and it was your most recent partner. But the most common symptom of all STIs is no symptom at all. You can be asymptomatic. And we hear that right now. It's, this is relevant with like coronavirus, COVID-19. Mm-hmm. You can be asymptomatic, transmit it to somebody else still not know that you have it. And the only way to know is to get tested. And herpes in particular is not tested regularly because it's not currently recommended by the CDC. So blanket testing doesn't happen. So most people don't even know. And then they transmit it to other people. And then you can be you can have a dormant infection where you don't have any signs or symptoms. And, um, and then all of a sudden, you get an outbreak. Like I did have an active outbreak a first outbreak. And that's how I initially got diagnosed. But some people never actually get an outbreak. So they just, Mm -hmm. they're carriers, and they can transmit the infection, but they actually don't ever, ever had signs or symptoms. When you got your first outbreak, did you know, okay, this is herpes? Or were you looking like something is wrong down here? And if you don't mind, like, what did it look like for you? Because the picture sometimes can be really scary. And then sometimes it looks like nothing looks like razor burn. Yes, and that and it really does run the gamut. Like it can go, it can be just a small kind, like tiny cut or tear, or, or like feel like a little abrasion, or you can have like a I would say like a half dollar size outbreak, fairly decent in size, tons of little blisters, and they're painful, uncomfortable. They start to itch at first. So for me, I had kind of what you might assume or what you might see in Google as like a traditional outbreak. And it was on my vulva, um, on the lips, and it was super uncomfortable. Um, Did you tell your mom? size. Yeah. So that's the thing. So at first I was like, I saw this, I was uncomfortable. I noticed it. I knew something was going on. But and I I wondered if it might be an STD STI and I was hoping it wasn't of course because that's everybody always hopes that and mm-hmm. um, but it got worse and it finally got to the point where it was so uncomfortable and it wasn't going away and it was more blisters were popping out um, that I finally told my mom and said like I I have something mm-hmm. happening and so she looked at it I had her look at it. And she mm-hmm. knew, in hindsight, she tells me this later, that she she thought she knew exactly what it was, but she was also hoping, just for my sake, that it wasn't mm-hmm. herpes, um, mm-hmm. just because of all the stigma and, you know, the ramifications, the social social ramifications of having any STI, but herpes in particular, because it's forever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I did have the actual physical outbreak, super uncomfortable. And the first outbreak, I should say that, like, with the caveat that the first outbreak is always usually the worst, and then over time... The severity and the duration of the of the actual um, symptoms tend to lessen and get fewer and farther between. And that's been true for me, too. Mm-hmm. How long was it between your first outbreak and the next one? Ooh, I don't know that question. Um I get free. I get regular outbreaks. So some people, like I said, will get one and then they never have another. Or some people will never get an outbreak. Or some people are like me and they get one once a month. And um, so right now I'm on suppressive therapy. I take an antiviral Valtrex every day in order to reduce the number of um, outbreaks. As well as that also reduces my partner's risk of contracting it from me. 
So there's multiple benefits for me in particular and for my body and how my body has responded to the virus. That's worked for me. But um, yeah, you, I, I, I want to say maybe a couple of months. I wasn't getting them like super frequent or recurring at that point in time, but everyone's body's different. It's based on your immune system and stuff. But I can't remember when the second one was actually. Hmm. Um. Did you, since you were so young and – I'm sure that you went through some type of denial, depression. Like, what are the feelings that you feel when the doctor does come back with your results and it's like you actually do have herpes? Oh, my gosh. For me, it was awful. I mean, absolutely 100% one of the worst experiences of my entire life. I mean, truth be told. And not to be – I'm not trying to be superfluous or, you know, over-sensationalize this. I mean, this is actually – most people will tell you similarly – that initial response. And also to make it worse is I had this doctor, he was just a general practitioner. I grew up in a really small country town outside of a bigger city. And um, so he was just like, he's, he was like our family doctor, you know, he like Mm -hmm. wrapped us, wrapped our arms when we had a broken arm and he diagnosed flus and colds and, you know, any manner of things. So um, at the time he took one look at it, walked out of the room, didn't say anything. And then, you know, said, you can you can go ahead and get dressed. And while I waited for like what seemed like five hours, I mean, I'm sure it was only like 10, 15 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. He came back in and said, you have herpes. It's the worst case I've ever seen. And here's a prescription. Oh, my God. Yes. (laughs) And I had like a bedside manner. (laughs) Oh, my God. Horrible. It was awful. I mean, what a. Not only do I have herpes, which means I am all these things, shameful, trashy, damaged, slutty, all these things that you, these misconceptions and myths that are associated with STIs, not only do I have it, I have the worst kind. So I'm the dirtiest, the sluttiest, you know, that's what goes through your head. That's the way in which that internalized stigma comes out and and how you process it. And um, yeah, so and there were no resources, no empathy, no support. And of all the people who you would think would be empathetic, you would think a medical practitioner, a doctor of some kind of clinician would be the most empathetic and understanding because they would have seen this and have experience. And so that additionally added on to the added another layer of like, well, if a doctor says this is the worst that they've ever seen, which also is untrue and ridiculous, because there's horrible pictures online of like, right, you know, blue waffle, don't Google that. I mean, don't, oh, don't I've Googled it before. No. I have too. Yes. Right. Is that a form of herpes? <laughs> Is blue waffle no, herpes? Uh, oh no, it's before, like I heard everybody when you talking see those worst it. case scenarios. It's it's third world countries. Somebody who's immunocompromised, who's very very ill, who doesn't have resources, who is already it usually has co coexisting conditions. I mean, mm. there's so many things that that usually is depicting. It's not the traditional. Even even the fact that I had a bad outbreak, like I said, it was probably the size of like a half dollar on Mm -hmm. probably on each side. I don't remember exactly how big it was, but it wasn't covering my entire vulva. Like my entire private parts weren't all covered in blisters. Like it was Mm -hmm. enough to be super uncomfortable. And like, I didn't want to wear underwear or sit down or put a tampon in. I mean, all that, all that stuff was like, absolutely not. But Mm -hmm. it still wasn't one of those things that you see like in, in, in sex ed classes that are just trying to shame you into abstinence and Anyways, yeah. So for me, like the doctor was awful, which made it worse. And there weren't any resources. And so my my overall feeling at that time, I cried the entire way home. I still remember my mom had a minivan, a red minivan. And like, you know, these you see these like specific pictures in your head and you just can't un- for, unsee these things at this when something traumatic like that happens. And I, I don't remember actually saying this, but mom says that all I said was nobody's ever going to love me again. No one's ever going to want me. What am I going to do? Like it was mm-hmm. pouring out of me, tears pouring down. I do remember like bawling the entire 15 minutes to get back to our home in the country. And but, was your mom yeah. supportive? Was she, did she make you feel better? Or was she like, yeah, you made some, be a long Yeah. Road. Or was she like, you shouldn't have been having sex? Like, 
No, I was lucky in that way and that my mom, like even before this had happened, like when I first got my period, she sat me down now at the kitchen table, which is kind of funny in hindsight because it didn't have to be this specific of a conversation. But she sat me down, grabbed a cup of water and a tampon and showed me what a tampon does and expands in your body. And she was like, so this is what happens, you know, if you want to use them and this is what happens in your body. And it's great because this is an option if you don't want to use pads and whatever. So my mom was pretty pretty sexual, um, sexually liberated, sex positive, and has Mm -hmm. always been pretty open that way. So she absolutely did not like shame me. She actually, she just felt so horrible for me. But I think at that time, no matter what she was going to say, I thought you just don't know. And like, you can, you can tell me that I'm beautiful, amazing. I'm still going to be able to have a wonderful life and this isn't going to make a difference and it's okay. And you're none of the things that you're saying. You can say that, but especially as a teenager, like no teenager thinks their parents really know what, what Mm -hmm. is going on, you know, like that's just the perception or skewed very, especially young teenagers and young adults. It's like the, the worldview is so minimal and small at that point in time because because of lack of like just exposure to all, all variety of things and diversity and such. So you naturally just think like, no, you don't know. So no matter mm-hmm. what she was going to say, I just didn't believe her anyways, basically. But she was really great and bless her heart. Um. So how long was it before you had sex again? And when you did start having sex again, did you let your partners know that you had herpes? Oh, so good question. And- I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> Did you have a follow up? Did you want to say something? Well, I was going to say that's kind of where the denial part comes in for me because I do feel like obviously a lot of people have herpes and I can count on one hand how many people in my whole life have said I have herpes Mm -hmm. and it is not even using all my fingers. It's probably like three. And I, I only have, know one person who's ever told me that they had it. So I'm curious to know. I feel like part of that denial that part comes partner. with people saying, acting like they don't have it. So I'm curious to know your story on that. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, is even though, you know, like Kiki knows one, Medina knows like three or four or something, really, the reality is you probably know like 20 or 30 people, you know, or like, Mm -hmm. especially in your even close friends and family and whatever, but just that's nobody's talking about it and sharing that and people are in denial. And quite honestly, I was too. So this was part of my motivation for the work that I do now. And when I launched the STI project was I didn't always disclose ethically. So to answer your question, um, the first time I had sex Mm -hmm. after I didn't tell the person and it was a friend's, um, my girlfriend's boyfriend's friend so Mm -hmm. she was dating a guy and his friend came over and like we were smoking pot doing some things like there weren't any parents home all hanging out and one thing led to another like they went off to go have sex and so it's just him and me and then um and she knew she knew that i had herpes then told him later was pissed at me um and understandably but i just really had no idea like how to have this conversation how to how to have how to have a conversation and still have casual sex and mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. i was 17 at that point in time then after that even even with that experience knowing that this is not necessarily what i want to do like i wasn't intending to harm anyone i wasn't trying to put someone's sexual health and health at risk i just had zero idea of how to have this conversation there was no like practical just peer-to-peer advice, like realistic conversations. There's was zero guidance. So I really was mortified and had no idea. And like, and, and that's not an excuse, right, to mm-hmm. do the wrong thing, but that's really the re- result and reality of why that happened. And so that's exactly part of my motivation is I thought if I don't, there's a problem that exists. I know I cannot be the only person who is not disclosed to somebody and then had sex with them, any kind of sexual activity. So... Am I a horrible shit person? Am I allowed to swear? Beep. Am I yeah. am I a horrible crap Definitely. person? Okay. So yeah, am I am I this shitty person? No. Did I do a shitty thing? Yes, absolutely. So how do we fix it? Well, we can't fix it if we don't acknowledge that the problem exists. If we don't say that there's tons of people not disclosing. And why aren't we disclosing? Well, 
the tons of reasons why we're not disclosing. There's no practical relevant resources. We're not sex positive. We're not encouraging conversation. I mean, you know, I can list mm-hmm. them all off, but again, that won't happen. We won't disclose. We won't have these conversations that are helpful um, if we don't actually address it and acknowledge that it happens. So I'm like, well, I'm going to, I'll own it and own that I didn't always tell people and I didn't always know how. And that was shitty. That was awful of me. It's not ethical. And um, I could have harmed people and or did. And that's not who I want to be. And it's not who I see myself as. But sometimes even the best people do some crappy things. So how do we mm-hmm. fix it? Did he yeah. end up getting herpes? I don't know. I don't know about him. That was a one night. Um, mm-hmm. And then I did have another uh, partner After that, who that's the only partner that um, I'm aware of I've ever transmitted herpes to. And that was a long term partner. We were together for three or four years. And that was also 17 years old. Same thing. Mm -hmm. I I did the like, ask for forgiveness, not permission and told him Mm -hmm. after the fact and realized like, I can't not tell him ever because that's going to cause an intimacy issue and a trust issue and it will no matter what now because I've already Mm -hmm. put him at risk and whatever and he was actually really amazing about it and like my first disclosure that was my first actual disclosure when I told him because the other guy I didn't end up telling he heard through the grapevine through the friend but I didn't actually disclose face to face so I still hadn't had experience with having that discussion Mm -hmm. and my first disclosure I was a hot mess I was like bawling and you know I was still processing the trauma and all of it and he was super cool and he did end up contracting herpes and then um, after that I've had other partners who I've disclosed to and who haven't contracted herpes from me so Mm -hmm. that sometimes happens too which is kind of a side note but if you're newly um, diagnosed and it's a new infection, you're more likely to transmit it um, mm-hmm. to other partners. And then more established infections, usually you have antibodies in your system. Also, you know safer sex practices or ways in which to reduce risk. And you're aware of the symptoms, the prodromal stuff, the, the like something is coming on, an outbreak is starting, so on and so forth. So I digress. But anyways, yeah. So it's been it's been like a big journey to try and figure out what's a good way of having this disclosure conversation. Conversation. So when you have the disclosure conversation now that you know more, what is that conversation like? So there's a few pieces of advice. Um, there's two schools of thought, first of all, around when to disclose. I guess that's probably the first step is when should somebody disclose. And um, some people like Obviously, the most ethical thing is before putting someone at risk. So you you must tell them before actually engaging in sexual activities. But from there, like you could tell them it could be on your dating profile. It could be on your Tinder. And some people Ooh, do that. They put it that's right bold. out there. And <laughs> I have seen that on the profile before. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yes. And and there's actually some benefit to that. It's six to one, half a dozen of the other, quite honestly, because the other side of that is waiting until the relationship is kind of heading in that direction. You've established some trust. You're super you're you're feeling like you're into this person and you, you can see it heading in that direction. And then you disclose. So if you put it right out there, right up front on your dating profile, there's a level of risk and safety. Not everybody is able to do that. But the folks who want to do that the the benefit and the reason why some people tend to go to that that side of the spectrum is that they are not emotionally invested at that point. They don't know mm-hmm. the person. So per, somebody might just swipe what is it swipe left and mm-hmm. um And so they didn't even know that that happened. They didn't even know somebody decided to say no as a result of their status, of their STI Mm -hmm. status. So then they're not emotionally invested. They're not feeling um, they're not feeling hurt as a result of that. But then the other side of it is um, there's a level of risk if you want that out in kind of a more public fashion and not everybody's able to do that. Um, there's a halfway point, which is kind of interesting. So there's numbers on the keyboard. It's like an old school traditional phone or like your keyboard on an actual computer keyboard. You spell out herpes. It's like 437, 437, something like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a combination of four, three, and seven. So that's like an indiscreet, but somewhat out there like right away in your profile but then you also have to assume that the person knows what those numbers are and then you still have to ask them and follow up like do you know what that means 
Um, so then you still have that conversation anyways. And then the other side of it, this is what I've tended to do because it just fits my personality and relationship style. I'm like a, I'm a serial monogamist is what I would, would call myself ostensibly. But, um, like I've had a lot of long, long term relationships, like two or three years and then, um, another two or three years and two or three years Mm -hmm. and such. So for me, it's made sense, um, it's made sense to do like wait until I see the relationship heading in that direction, mm-hmm. and um, and then to disclose. So yeah, so are they that's typically like the upset two with you? Options. Okay, are they typically? Upset? Have you ever had someone be like, "Why the fuck would you not tell me this up front?" No, actually, nobody's ever said that. Um, which I kind of mm. wondered. Some people I've seen online when discussing disclosure, I've seen some folks kind of flippantly say like, "If you wait." that's a bait and switch and that's really unfair to the person um, because you're basically leading them on until then you tell them this horrible thing about you ostensibly Mm -hmm. quote unquote this horrible thing but my argument to that and why that's an illogical assumption is nobody puts everything out on the table the first time they meet somebody nobody says i have a brother in prison i'm a hundred thousand dollars in debt um I Even mental illness or something sex. like that. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a, there's like 5 million different things that could be no's for people. That could be a hard no. All different mm-hmm. reasons, right? That people decide like, uh-uh, I'm not going to go there. Like, absolutely not. This is not going to work. But most of uh, – nobody's going to tell you all of that shit right on the – right on the first date. Like, that is not even realistic in like normal human interaction. Nobody does that. We're all in our best behavior. We're all trying to present ourselves in the best light possible. Like, that is just how that works. That's courting, mating, dating, whatever. So I think that that's some BS, some next level BS, and it speaks to the stigma. It speaks to the pervasiveness and how severe the stigma is that somebody would put an STI status as worse than pretty much anything else that you could possibly say or do. And that's it's just not true, first of all. The reality of living with an STI is very different than that kind of assumption. Um, And there are so many worse things that actually relate to your character and like how living with you or loving you or being with you might actually relate. Like an STI is something you have, not something you are or something you do. And that's the distinction. So yeah, I've never, I've heard that in comments, but I've never actually had that experience at all. Actually, the people who I've disclosed to have all been like, oh, that's what you were going to say? I thought you were going to say something so much worse. Like, okay, no big deal. (laughs) And they've all been like, wow, that's not a thing. And it it shocked me. Every single time, I always just assume there's going to be someone who is Mm -hmm. not okay with it. And I know that in other people, mind you, other people have told me for sure that they've had like, they've had a bad disclosure or or a a disclosure where it turned out being a rejection or the the person Mm -hmm. decided not to move forward, which I don't even necessarily would call that bad because that might be actually a benefit. And that might be like the universe just working in the way that it needs to because that person wasn't going to be aligned with you anyways. But anyway... Um, yeah, so I I know that people don't always have that amazing experience and have that e- e- reaction. But for me, I mean, everyone's just been like, okay, so that's it. Like, that doesn't change who you are. Like, <laughs> I'm have like, you well, ever yeah, had, but have you ever told someone and they were like, I have it too? Mm. No, you know, that's shocking to me and surprising because I mean, like I said, I'm 37. I've had many partners at this point in time. I don't even know the number. Not that that's relevant or matters or whatever. None of us do, girl. (laughs) Yes. Cheers to that. Like, amen. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I, I mean... I've have literally not had anybody, which is which is unusual because herpes is so common. So although, well, that was going to be a different story. I'm going to share this story in 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 a, in a different like moment or, or th- something. Anyways, I'm going to scrap that, scrap that in because <laughs> there's there's something I can share about that, but I haven't actually met um, any or haven't had a partner who has herpes. Okay. Do you do you think that you can can't not do you think? Can you still have fun sex having herpes and having to tell everyone that you have herpes? Like can you still have a threesome? Or like do you go to sex clubs? Like how how do you still have fun sex with herpes? Cuz you don't want to be the one to be like everyone calls you in the morning like, "Ah, we all got it." 
bitch. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, like, they wouldn't even know if it was from you or if it had, I mean, you wouldn't know that fast, right. of True. course. But right, I mean, you know, in, in just just for the sake of, you know, entertainment. But um, yes, you absolutely can. You can definitely still like hook up and have casual sex. You can have multiple partners. Um, before I realized and figured out like I'm a serial monogamist and that just suits me and my personality and my and what 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 feels good for me. I did I did try swinging um, in multiple partners and um, a semi non monogamous relationship and, and as well that was along the same time that I did swinging and went to some sex clubs and things like that. And um, you'd be surprised actually at in that environment there were a lot of people that had herpes and that talked about it or that disclosed or that um, some of it was they just disclosed certain boundaries of if we're they would only want to do certain activities and they would say they would want certain barriers involved um, whether it be like dams or usually dams weren't used I I would love it if they were more common but just nobody uses them but most people wanted condoms dental dams in that environment dental dams Mm mm-hmm and um yeah internal or external condoms and yeah so it just depended on the environment but the answer the short answer is absolute yes of course it just it, it just includes an additional conversation and it's not even really additional in a non-monogamous in the non-monogamy community in the polyam community and non-ethical non-monogamy community um there's already a lot of conversation that happens that is a di- that is a little bit additional on top of what a monogamous the monogamous hetero community does and it's great because it's it's thoughtful it's helpful and it encourages and and aids in the pleasure that is had and that's the Mm -hmm. whole point of all of it anyway so yeah it's actually really lovely and i wish that the the monogamous community would be a little more receptive and learn from the folks who've experienced this and done um a little bit more of a casual sex and or multiple partners or multiple partners at a time multiple relationships so yeah absolutely tons and tons of folks that I consult with are um, polyam or, you know, enjoy mm-hmm. just casual sex and don't really want a relationship at this point in time. Are yeah. there dating apps and or sex clubs geared towards people who have STIs and STDs? And do you think that that doesn't help with destigmatizing the whole thing? Yeah, that's if a super are. good question. So there's, I'm not aware of any sex club specific, like, Although, okay, so first of all, there are STI dating apps, like Positive Singles, and um, some people love it and some people hate it. And some people do feel like an STI-specific dating app actually contributes to stigma. However, mm-hmm. and I can, I can see the point there or where that's coming from, but here's what I would say about that. Everyone's going to be a little bit different and... After a very traumatizing diagnosis where the number one question that I get from so many people is, how am I going to have this disclosure conversation? How am I going to tell a new partner? Is anyone ever going to want me again? I mean, that is the, those, those things in any different style of language comes out over and over and over again. So sometimes what's nice about like an STI specific dating app is it helps people to break the ice again, to like get back Mm -hmm. out there and realize like, wait a minute, like I got this. I don't need to self segregate. And I don't think anyone needs to. I've actually never, even though I'm, I'm the spokesperson for positive singles and I've actually never specifically dated people with herpes or even sought that out. So I think that it fits for some people and some personality types. Mm -hmm. It's also a way to find additional people and meet other folks um, who have the same experience. And a lot of times there's like additional community links and Mm -hmm. blogs and stuff like that. So in some ways, it's a way to find some resources. It's a way to start um, dating again, if you're absolutely petrified of having that conversation and getting back out there in like a more traditional sense. But I don't think that that is necessary or that people need to self-segregate at all. And that you're, assumption would contribute to stigma. You're okay. married, right? Yes. How long have you been married? We've been married now. I've been married. Um, 
three, going on four years. It'll be four years in December. We've been together five, almost so, five. So how did your husband feel or how does he feel now about you being so vocal I was about, about having herpes that. online? Yes. It's so great because he just did a TikTok with me. I, I just got on TikTok recently and like I'm I such a Karen. I still don't know how to work and- it. <laughs> Can't it's, so, it's fun. I mean, it it, ta- it took me a minute. I had I googled and I seriously googled and watched a whole bunch of YouTube videos of like these teenagers <laughs> saying how to get how to get viral in a, in a week, how to get TikTok mm-hmm. viral. And I did, and these were like literally sixteen year olds telling me how to do this. And I'm like, I don't care. I'll learn from whomever. I mean, <laughs> hey, if you've got it figured out, like fi- help help this old lady figure this stuff out. So. <laughs> Um, anyway, yes. And I did get called. I got called a young Karen on TikTok. <laughs> TikTok can be brutal. Oh, my gosh. Which I thought was endearing. I was like, that's that's the first time I've ever been called that. So I was like, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to make sure to call the manager. <laughs> but so your husband, is he ever annoyed with how much you talk about having? Is he ever like, Janelle, why Shut does everyone up. need to know? <laughs> No, you know what's funny about it is the reason he reached out, he like hopped into my DMs and um and he was speaking about the work that I was doing. And so at the time, so this is kind of a cute story. We met on well, we didn't really meet on Facebook, but he reached out to me on Facebook. I had been following a sexologist who was doing with her husband um 88 dates with her husband and they would go on these dates and it'd be like some of them would be expensive some of them would be like a picnic all sorts of things and then they'd rate them like on a scale of one to ten how much they enjoyed it and how much it cost and then she'd post pictures and when she first started doing it i was at the end of a long-term relationship and i was feeling like salty because i wanted to do that with that partner but we just weren't there and so then we broke up and i was single and i'm like well now what like i really wanted to do this 88 dates i thought that was super cute and i thought you know i thought you know what fuck that i'm going to do i'm going <laughs> to date myself i'm going to mm-hmm. do 88 master dates i'm going to master date and um, i'm going to post about master dating and so i was doing this master dating and what's master dating out- like master- Masturbating, but dating. Like, uh huh, like dating myself. <laughs> oh, got you. Okay. Of masturbating, master dating. Mm-hmm. So, which I actually, I didn't do that. I could have actually I done like, try a that. masturbation date. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So I would go on these, I would go on like these little adventures. I'd do like a, a walk at a nature center or whatever. And mm-hmm. I'd rate it on a scale of one to 10. How much did I enjoy it doing it alone? Like every once in a while, there's something you really wish you could share with someone. It doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. have to be a partner. You just wish someone was there to be like, oh my gosh, check that out or whatever. So I would rate it. And then he said like, this is such a cool idea. Like dating hasn't been working for me. And he hopped into my DMs and and he said, like, I love everything that you're doing. And, and he was like, your empowerment and your confidence is so wonderful and beautiful. And you're so inspiring. And this is when I was still, I was a public STI educator and advocate. So it was actually w- my work that got him interested. So, and, and I, that's true for, I've had so many more people reach out and like hit on me and, um, and want to see if I'm single and all sorts of things, you know, as a result of doing this work than even beforehand, which shocks me, but it's wonderful. And it shouldn't shock me, but it's wonderful. I hope, I think that that gives a lot of our listeners who have been told that they have herpes hope. And even if you don't have herpes, like that just gave me hope that like there is somebody for everybody because- And if something changes and you do happen to get it, it's not the end of the world. Right. And you because can people continue do make to you date. Feel that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just, that is kind of what the rhetoric is around herpes. It's like, oh my God, who is gonna, who is gonna wanna have casual sex with you? But you're, I feel like you are, what you're doing is- phenomenal like spreading the word and making people feel comfortable having that conversation or if you've had it already like the next time you have to have the conversation um Mm -hmm. that must be very i feel like it can be stressful if you're not comfortable with it yet (laughs) 
Yeah. So stressful. And it's okay to not want an infection, right? Like that makes sense. Like we don't Mm -hmm. want any additional malady or health issue. Nobody does. But like that's a part of the human experience. Our bodies are amazing, but they're not infallible. So we we try to reduce our risk as much as possible but you make a you make a calculated risk with everything you do like when you go mm. to the store to the grocery store you now nowadays you might grab your mask and before you even get driving down the road you buckle your seatbelt and you look before you turn and you do all of these things but you still could get in a car accident you still could contract coronavirus at this point in time mm-hmm. you know there's there's all sorts of risk out there but what do you want you want to eat you want to go and get some munchies or whatever it is you're getting at the store at that point in time who cares whether it's essential or not i mean there's a risk reward calculation that happens and pleasure is so important in intimacy and touch and sexual activity and enjoying that and wanting that if that's something that you want you know there are folks who don't necessarily want that and that's okay too but yeah Mm -hmm. nobody wants an infection but if you do contract one it is going to be okay it's not the end of the world i know that's hard to believe even when you're experiencing it but i mean i can i yeah i want people i would wish everyone knew that so much Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you will have the answer. I hope that you do. I want to go back to like having herpes and the fact that it can lay dormant in your body and you have to ask for the test because they're not just going to give it to you. Are there times where it's more likely you can get an accurate result? Is it only during an outbreak that your result will be the most accurate? Well, anything when there are signs and symptoms is much easier to diagnose. However, um, to speak to more of along the lines of like testing for herpes, if you don't have any signs or symptoms, you don't have an outbreak and you would like to get tested, you would have to ask for it. You might have to pay for it. Um, Mm -hmm. And you may get some pushback from the provider because it's not currently recommended like um, blanket testing and regular testing for herpes. But... If you still were like, I really want to get this done, I really want to get tested, then yes, after like four to six weeks of exposure. So say you hooked up with someone and you would like to add herpes testing to your whole STI panel that you're getting done, waiting Mm -hmm. four to six weeks, you're going to have a much, um, you'll be, it's a much likely, the result will be much more likely to be accurate at that point in time. It's much more likely to be accurate the longer you wait. So if you, and this is the tendency, most people will have, you know, like a spontaneous whatnot on a Friday, Saturday and like, or an oops, they might feel like it's an oops, like, especially if it wasn't really that enjoyable. And um, (laughs) that said, on Monday morning, they're like, oh shit, like this is, I need to go in. I need to like get tested and figure this out right away. So... If you did have exposure, there is some benefit to going in right away because you there are some things um, like uh, that you could take that might reduce your risk of contracting some infections immediately. However, mm-hmm. if you get an STI panel done on Monday morning after a couple of days later after a hookup, none of those results are going to be accurate. They're all going to say negative and you will actually potentially have an infection. So yes, like the actual... Truth be told, you need to like pause, take a beat, and then wait a couple of weeks and then get tested. That's what makes it so easy to spread anything. (laughs) Yeah. Especially her. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you did Mm -hmm. get tested. So now you feel like I don't have it, but you didn't realize it's too soon. Yeah. And then Friday comes again and it's, oops, there goes my Mm -hmm. skirt over my head. (laughs) Again. (laughs) Oh, man, I had a question and it just left my mind. We were talking about Um, that. Oh, it was a good one. Okay. Um, What did I want to ask you? I know I already asked you about the um, your personal outbreak. Um, So I'll tell you guys this. uh, So there was this guy that slept with him before. And it had been like years since we slept together. He called me one day and he had he had an outbreak. He didn't know what it was. He went and got tested. Test came back positive. So he's like running down the list. Mm-hmm. So when he gets to me, and I'm sure the list was very long because that's why I stopped sleeping with him. But that's beside the point. Do I know him? Mm-mm. Okay. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> I'm nosy. She is. 
see how you try to slide that in there. <laughs> no, you don't know him. But uh, so he gets to me and he's like, hey, I have to talk to you about something. Are you sitting down? So I was like, how'd you get this number? <laughs> Change my number. But anyway, so he's like, oh, you know, I have herpes. Um, I have herpes one and two. I got tested for it. I have it. And I was like, well, I knew you had the one where you get the fever blisters. Like, you told me you had fever blisters. I knew that. I don't think that he understood that that's part of herpes. But, you know, whatever. Um, So I was like, okay. So how long have you had it? And why didn't you tell me before? Like, I'm a little confused. He was like, well, I just got tested. I just found out. I honestly don't know where I got it from. Um, So I don't know if I exposed you to it or not. But I want you to go get tested. I'm really sorry if I gave it to you, but I literally just found out. I'm going to email you my results. It's got a date on it, but please go get tested because if you have it, I want you to be able to do something about it. So I was like, okay, well, no, I've been tested for it. And I I knew beforehand to request to get tested for it just from being super anal online. I knew to request the test. So I had been tested, but I had never had an outbreak. So it's like, okay, well, I still could have had it. Let me go back. So I went and, you know, he said, he called me later and he was like, you know, I really appreciate that you didn't flip out on me because everybody I called before you flipped out. And I was like, well, just me, to me, it's like, okay, it's really inconvenient. Sounds very uncomfortable to talk about, to have and everything. But at the end of the day, as I really thought about it, what else does it do to you besides give you an uncomfortable rash? So I was like, you know, I appreciate you for, yeah, I appreciate you for telling me. And, um, it let me realize like, don't flip out on people and it's not the end of the world. And then he was like really depressed about it. And so I was just trying to be like, even though he wasn't my friend, I was still trying to be a friend in that moment because I recognized he needed it. And I just hope that more people can be um, honest with people when they find out that they have it and let them know because I, I really appreciate it. And it was eye opening because it was like, OK, I inspected it. I didn't see anything. But what does that mean? He still mm-hmm. had it. and He has no idea how long he had it. Oh, there's so so many things that you just said. Two good things. First of all, good on him because so Mm -hmm. many people aren't going to do that. And I don't necessarily think that there is a responsibility for somebody to go back through all of their old partners unless they feel like that is something that they need to do, unless they feel like Mm -hmm. that is the most ethical thing. I actually think that that's a Mm -hmm. gray area of... um, Unless it was just an immediately recent partner, that might he be probably only called the girls he wanted to come back to. Honestly, I'll just tell you that because this is <laughs> not a good citizen. It was the ones he wanted to come back to. I doubt it was everybody. <laughs> but then the second part of what you said was good is that so many people think like, yeah, I'll be able to tell. I'll know, you know, like. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll be able to see something. I'm going to see like the bumps. Most, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, no one's going to be having sex when they have an outbreak or when they have serious symptoms, the vast majority of people anyways, because that shit is not comfortable. Like that is the last thing you're thinking about is how you want to get down with some sexy time. Like, no, thank <laughs> you. You just want to like mm-hmm. hide in your sweatpants and eat some macaroni and cheese and watch Netflix. Like that's <laughs> even like somewhat miserable, you know, like absolutely not. So that's the silly part is everybody just thinks they're going to know and that that's not the mm-hmm. people that they're with. And they'd be able to mm-hmm. know and it's just no sorry sorry that's not so how that works. <laughs> i remember my question and i'm not sure if you would be able to answer this but why is herpes since so many people have it why is it not just already with the check why do you have to request it do you know that answer Yes. So that's a really good question because most people assume like, first of all, when people get an STI panel and they say, test me for all the STIs, test me for all the things. I want to get tested for everything. And then they come back and they're like, I'm clean. I don't have anything. I was tested for everything. If somebody tells you all of those and uses those words in that language in particular, any any piece of the, that language, that means that they're not fully aware that they can't be tested for all the things. They can't be tested for everything. If you're sexually active, there's actually no way to know that you're entirely negative for all infections because all infections they don't have tests for. And herpes in particular doesn't usually get tested and is not a part of an STI panel. And the reason why is because 
There's a few reasons. One, the testing efficacy, meaning like the reliability of the tests varies greatly across the different types of tests that are available. They're not, um, they're not very, there's a lot of uh, negative or false, false negatives and false positives. Um, and there's more false negatives than there are false positive. False negatives mm-hmm. are super common. And for the reasons we just talked about, right? Like you can get tested and, and have it, but you're too early. So that's part of it. Then also, if you do, and herpes testing is a blood test. So if you don't have an outbreak and you just get a test, it's a blood test. If, if anybody ever asks you or says we have a urine test available, that's some crap and junk and don't do it. That is absolutely not the way to test for herpes and um, is not reliable whatsoever. So just as a, as a note, a side note. But anyways, if you get a blood test done and you test positive for HSV1 or HSV2, you don't mm-hmm. know where it's located. There's no way to tell. So HSV1 was traditionally thought of as like the cold sore, the fever blisters, you know, like mm-hmm. Kiki was talking about. But now we know that that can be transmitted through oral sex genitally to the genitals. So that means if you get a blood test and it says, yes, you have HSV-1, is it highly likely that it might be oral? I mean, highly likely that it might. That's contradicting in and of itself, the words I just used. But that's that's exactly the point, is that you don't know where it's located. Yes, it could be oral, but it also could be a genital infection and vice versa. HSV-2 Mm -hmm. is commonly and most often genital, but it can also be transmitted orally. So you don't know where it's located. And then that in and of itself causes all sorts of like concern, questions, trauma, unnecessary um, confusion and frustration. And so some medical practitioners kind of believe along the lines of like, if you're not getting an outbreak, what you don't know is not going to hurt you because knowing Mm -hmm. is going to be more problematic. You don't know where it's located. You don't know when you contracted it. You're going to ask all these questions Mm. of who did I get it from? There's no way of knowing. So there's a massive amount of uncertainty. The cost is expensive. Um, There aren't a lot of very reliable tests out there. The ones that are reliable are much more expensive. You know, so for all of those reasons, that's why the CDC currently does not recommend testing. The times that they do, like like you guys have said already, yes, you can ask for it. And um, in some places are going to be more receptive to that or or say you can get it, but you'd have to pay extra or whatever. But the Mm -hmm. times that it is recommended is if you do have an outbreak or if you do have signs or symptoms, then they definitely will get a test done for you. And or if you've recently been with a partner whom you know actually has herpes. So like say you slept with Mm -hmm. me and then you knew and said, I just hooked up with Janelle and she has herpes and I know she has, like, can I get tested or whatever? So all my past partners, you know how I said I was like a serial monogamist, all of them have gotten tested. And I've only like, as far as I'm aware, I've only transmitted to one because after we were done in this long term relationship, they're all like, okay, well, is this something I'm going to have to deal with? Because they also knew at that point in time, it could be asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. once I learned that you had to ask for the test I honestly y'all I lied to the doctor I was like oh my god my boyfriend cheated on me I told the same lie every time my boyfriend cheated on me he told me he's been cheating on me for a year he has herpes now um I don't know how long he's had it and he's already a liar so I don't trust anything then cue the tears and I'm like can you please test me it was all a lie I just wanted to keep getting tested but I knew um that they would give me pushback because I read it in my favorite magazine Cosmo they had like a whole thing about herpes and these girls share their experience I was like oh my god I didn't know this I need to go get tested Mm. I've been having sex with a lot of people (laughs) <laughs> I gotta figure this out, but yeah, uh huh, yeah. Oh, hey, so maybe do that do. if your doctor is giving you pushback. <laughs> that you might have read the article that I was in. I was in Cosmo. I flew to New York. And I did, might have did a photo shoot, and wow. <laughs> it very well could have been. But it's a, it's a shame that like you know, Medina, you were you said like so many people have it. Like if we were just aware that so many people had it, and this was more a Mm well-known well-known knowledge if this was if this was more accessible and understood then there wouldn't be such a stigma because part of the reason that stigma in general exists on any kind of marginalized group or community um Mm -hmm. and here's a good like example if you think of lgbtqi community if you if you look back in like the 1970s or 80s and you ask someone do you know someone who's lgbtqi And most people would be like, no, I don't know anyone who is in that category, who that's their identity. Um, But nowadays, if you ask 
anyone, everybody knows someone who's LGBTQI or many someone's mm-hmm. and, and people who are close to them, who they love, respect, trust, mm-hmm. and admire. So once you start to actually personally have a relationship with people in these, whatever category we're talking about, whatever stigmatized, stig, stigmatized category or marginalized group, in mental health is another stigmatized mm-hmm. one, but everybody knows somebody who's struggled with some sort of mental health, anxiety, depression, whatever. Now it's not as easy to group all of these people into a category and say they're all crap because now I care about and know and love someone who's in that mm-hmm. category. So we can't just lump everybody. But when you talk about STIs, that's not true yet with STIs because most people only know at max if they even know one or two or three. And in reality, especially with herpes in particular, but all of them, there are so many people who have it. But because there's not regular testing being done and because it's asymptomatic very commonly, there are all these people who have it. Nobody's talking about it. Even the ones who know that Mm -hmm. they have it are definitely not sharing that stuff unless they absolutely have to. And so we go along thinking, oh, it's only these kinds of people, quote unquote. It's Mm -hmm. only a small portion of certain subsets of society when reality, it's everyone. It's all Mm -hmm. of us. Okay, it mm-hmm. it probably is. Um, <laughs> before we move on to indecisive, Diane, I'm curious to know: Do you have any tips for our listeners um, about living a healthy lifestyle with herpes? Like, as far as even like things that people might not know, like changing your eating habits. I know one of my girlfriends who was diagnosed and married now. Congrats, girl! She had to take a lot of sugar out of her diet. She said that she noticed certain things that she was eating that would cause outbreaks. And so do you have anything to share with our listeners about some tips, like just some tips? Yeah, so I think this is going to be specific to each individual and everyone. Um, I encourage everyone to do their own research and determine what is going to suit their body and their needs best. And But that said, there are definitely certain things that trigger outbreaks and that are known to trigger outbreaks like chocolate, sunshine, L-arginine, which is an amino acid, and that's in nuts and different kinds of foods and not to list them all and that would get really boring. But there are mm-hmm. definitely certain foods that um, that would trigger an outbreak or trigger symptoms. And there mm-hmm. are other things uh, uh, opposite wise that would counter that and then of course your immune system and how healthy you are on a regular everyday basis impacts and contributes to your symptoms and whether you're asymptomatically shedding a little bit as well that said i don't feel like that's going to suit everyone and it's not accessible like for all people to just all of a sudden now we're going to eat all the fruits and vegetables and all this non-GMOs and whatever. So I I hate Mm -hmm. to, I am not one of those people who's going to say like, this is all the things you need to do to Mm -hmm. make your body the healthiest, to have the least amount of symptoms or things. There's definitely tons of information out there that will talk about the stuff and the foods that you can eat. And you definitely absolutely can. Um, And sugars in general sometimes impact Um, if you're a person with a vagina, impact the vagina in a lot of different ways anyway. So that might be something Mm -hmm. you might be interested in just because, just for the health of your overall yoni. But um, I think it's going to be specific to everybody's resources and access and what is really going to suit their lifestyle, what is going to make sense for them. Cool. Okay. Um, All right, y'all. We're going to move on to Indecisive Diane. And when we come back, we will read some advice letters. Would you stop thinking about what everyone wants? Stop thinking about what I want, what he wants, what your parents want. What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What do you want? What do you want? Okay, Diane, what date idea do you have for us this week? They're kind of starting to open stuff up back in Atlanta. What you got for us, girl? 
Hey ladies, it's me, Indecisive Diane. I'm going to keep this short and quick and to the point. Have a picnic with your loved ones. They're starting to open up the places back in Atlanta. Find a cute little park. I wouldn't suggest Piedmont or anything like that. Find a cute little quaint park. Take a blanket. Take a sheet. Take the dogs. Take your mans. Take your lady. Take your kids. Take some snacks. Take a bottle of wine. Hell, take a hookah if you want. Have fun, have a picnic, get some vitamin D. And I don't mean, okay, girl. Thanks, Diane. No problem, ladies. Bye. Okay, and now we're back and it's time for advice. Remember, if you would like some advice from us and possibly if we have a guest, the other person too, send it to askcocktails at gmail.com. That's A-S-K-C-O-C-K-T-A-L-E-S at gmail. Dot com and perhaps we'll read it on the show. Now you go ahead and read. I'm going to be listening. I have to use the restroom. Okay. <laughs> okay, Janelle. So our first advice letter, they put in the subject line, horny as hell, but watching my body count. So she says, please don't read out my email address, girl. We never do. I don't even know why you said that. Hey guys, I love your podcast. You guys are great. Keep shining. So I recently, six weeks ago, got out of a five-year long-term relationship. This guy was my first everything. And honestly, honestly, I thought I was going to marry him. And my love for him still runs deep. But ultimately, we just want different things for our lives. So it's never going to work. So here's the thing. We last fucked two months ago, and that's the last time I got any action. I'm hella horny, and I don't want to increase my body count. I have a religious background and a strong culture. So really, the fact that I even slept with my ex-boyfriend is a big issue. But I'm horny. So my question is, can I just sleep with my ex for now until I find something solid that will hopefully end in marriage? Confused face. Oh, wow. (laughs) There's so much to unpack there. So There's so much. I feel like you can do whatever you damn well want to. And like, is there is there some risk in sleeping with your ex emotionally? Definitely. Maybe there might seem to be less of a like a physical risk in terms of safer Mm -hmm. sex and STIs and such, but also do we know what your ex is doing and are they sleeping with anybody else and Mm -hmm. are they going to be honest about that? So there still may be the same level of risk as if there were a new partner. Secondarily, Mm -hmm. what about like self-pleasure, masturbate? And I know that gets a little old and if you want like actual like, you know, skin hunger in another individual. So there's that. But I know like you, you had the same face, Medina, of like, oh man, even the it, there's such a contradiction and I, I can empathize with that too because I grew up in like a religious, went to youth group and all of that mm-hmm. and was in the small rural commu- rural community. I hate that word. I can't say it very well. But anyways, <laughs> um, so I think that there's like a confliction of like you, this this person is aware that it's okay to want pleasure, to be horny, to seek that or, or need that. And that is a human need. It's a human mm-hmm. right. I believe. So the body count is like, what is that? What even is that? I mean, that's so Mm. subjective (laughs) and ridiculous and harmful. It's harming that Mm. person. And I think that that's kind of like something that needs to be considered and processed of like, should we unpack that? Should we unlearn that? Because would that Mm -hmm. help empower you to make the best decisions? Because there's all sorts of things you can do too that are lower risk, like different kinds of activities that are still intimate, still sexual, if you don't want like P and V with more people. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I personally am going to say like the body count girl, goodbye with that. But if that's like your personal thing, okay, cool. But like, no, I emotionally cannot. And I've done this before. You go back to an ex and you're making excuses to keep them in your life. And I feel like that's what sis is doing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that if you still have feelings for someone, if you want to get married and that person does not want to marry you, I don't think it's smart to go back and share your body with them. Because if you are anything like me and your emotions are on your sleeves, your feelings are going to get hurt. 
God forbid you accidentally get pregnant and you're not going to end up with him. I mean, I feel like people don't look at some of the risks that you're taking. Maybe this yeah. last time you go sleep with him and you get pregnant, bruh, and he y'all don't want to be together or he, whoever doesn't want to be with whoever. I think there is enough dick out here for you to find somebody else. <laughs> I think it's only yes. okay to go back to somebody who you strictly had a just sex relationship. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter. If you've already established in the beginning, years ago, months ago, however long ago, that this person, you don't have that emotional connection with them and you went to them to seek pleasure and then maybe you stopped because you got a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever and then you go back. I think that that can be okay. But this, no, I wouldn't do it. You're going to be confused. You're going to be crying. Then, then you're going to send another advice. You're going to be gonna crying. Be different. Don't have sex with him. Get a toy. They're still shipping. Amazon people may be mad, but like we said earlier, not essential, essential. It's a risk involved. Just, just take it. <laughs> this is going to be better than like crying. To Don't do it, A sis. toy, your mm-hmm. hand. Like, I mean, goodness. And that it's so true. Like the emotional risk is not being considered. It's like the physical risk somehow outweighs the emotional risk. And actually the physical risk is usually short term and or right. kind of like – non-big it's not a big deal other than that this emotional stuff really can mess with you for long periods of time so that's the Mm -hmm. risk that this person is considering taking to just reduce a physical and there's so many other options physically Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah okay next letter okay hey kiki and medina i love the show and y'all are like my best friends because you know you can't tell your real friends all the juiciness in your life so i need an outside opinion I'll try my best to keep it short. I've been in a situation ship for two years now. I'm 22 and my lover is 27. He's Nigerian, born and raised. So, you know, the dick is amazing. We met off Tinder. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, sis. <laughs> We met off Tinder and fucked the first day we met and never left each other since. Um, now we've got into, now we've got into it a couple of times, but one time about a year ago, I asked him if he genuinely likes me and he said yes. So I was content. I feel like he really likes me. I want to say love, but I don't know if I'm dragging it. Anyway, this Valentine's comes up and I act a whole ass because I didn't get asked on a date or nothing. I brought it up and he said he hates Valentine's Day and he doesn't do anything for anybody, which is a lie. I checked his ex's page, and here's a little background. They were together when they were like 14, and he moved to London, then America, so it's kind of a failed relationship, so we think. She posts this candy she got and then says, the details. Like, bitch, what details? He's millions of miles away. Then posts him and doesn't say anything on the picture or her story. We argue. I asked if they're together. He said he isn't with anybody and he's single. She posted the other people. She posted other people like friends and stuff, but I'm confused. Fast forward. I let it go because if you say you're single, you're single. But he was really upset that I asked. I want to move forward with him. I don't want a relationship, but it would be nice to know that somebody is there. I'm still young too, so I don't want to miss my husband. <laughs> or nothing but if what if he is my husband every time i get with somebody else it's not competition to even compare now it's like i can't stop thinking about him to be honest i feel like i'm really in love with him every bit of him he treats me right he answers when i call he seems like he cares but i don't know what to do so I, should i just leave it alone and let them be or give it a little while and have a talk about it or just leave signed a love dummy i'm gonna add some pics of me the girlfriend who's not the girlfriend and him i'm the light one by the way sent from my iphone um, I don't know why you see the pictures because it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, this is what I think about it. I think like you said he does all of these things and he makes you happy and you don't even want a relationship. Why are you worried about what else he's doing? Sending chocolates to somebody in Nigeria <laughs> and he's in America. Are you trying to go on 90 day I fiance? Was just about to say, you're about to be on 90 day fiance. What's going on? I don't get it. Like, I feel like you're stressing yourself out and maybe it's because you feel like you want to talk to your friends about it and they're going to run an investigation. Be like, girl, he's talking to this girl. Let that go. Let it go. I The crazy thing is when y'all send in the advice letters, which we really do appreciate, you know, send them for next week as cocktails at gmail.com. <laughs> um, but sometimes with some of these emails, I know 
and I don't even know you, sis, mm-hmm. but I know that you know you need to get somebody else because you sent- Just make a decision. You sent a five paragraph email. You know what oh, you need to one. do. As long as hell, yeah, yeah. Like if if you're gonna, I think I think you personally need to get over it. But if you can't, which you probably can't, you have to let him go because then you're gonna be doing little things and it's gonna ruin all of the greatness that you say that you have. You don't want that. Like, do you want to be happy or do you want to be miserable? Mm-hmm. At some point, you have to make a choice. And if you dealing with him because and he, knowing that he has this other girl that he may not be with, but He has some relationship with, of some sort. If that's going to bother you, that's not the man for you. And that's that. Don't be afraid to be alone for a minute. Janelle, do you want to add anything? Hmm. I think y'all said it really well. She is the answer. She actually knows. She said it. It's just, it's, it's the having the answer and doing the thing that needs to be done. Whatever her answer is, is, is that's that second jump and leap and step. And Mm -hmm. I think she's saying her needs aren't being met, even though she's saying, like, Mm -hmm. this is all great. That's all great. But there's a but. There continues to be a but. And if there's a but, then that's a problem. And your needs, you deserve your needs being met, as all people do. And if that relationship is not doing that for whatever reason, even if things are amazing, you either have to accept that, that this is exactly how it's going to be, because that individual is showing you and making it clear and actually communicating even like what he does and what he wants to do and how he wants to move forward. And if that's not going to suit you, you can't change that person. You can't make them do what you need and what you want. So at that point in time, are you fine with that for the temporary time being? And mm-hmm. are you going to open it up and potentially see other people because maybe you'll meet that husband? Or are you not able to do that? And like, not everyone's able to do the multiple partner thing. And that can seem like a lot of work or a lot of juggle, a lot of emotional stuff going on. Then it's then, then you know the answer. You know the answer, Chica. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you got it. You got it in you. You, got you just got to do it and take that leap. You got yeah. it, girl. You got it. And that... Janelle, that brings us to the last segment of our show, which is cocktails. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Uh-huh. Fuck, I want, fuck, but if ain't got a buck, I won't cup Spend a hundred on me, it ain't nothing. Run a double D, so stuff. Back to the point. Is it some cash in this place? If it is, I'll probably see the stats in your face. Turn around. Once upon a time, not long ago, I was a hoe. What cocktails is all about, what helped grow this show is Kiki and I giving our personal, very raw sex stories. Embarrassing. I've said way too much lately. I am so embarrassed. I hope you have one, Janelle, because I have to save mine for another day. (laughs) I have been, I have been out of control and it's quarantine. I shouldn't be out of control, right? But I am. And I think I've got some better stuff coming. So I'm going to say mine for next week, personally. I am, too. And honestly, oh, we over time. Mm-hmm. We're over time. Okay, and I might have another one. What do you have? I I don't use the word should. And even in coronavirus, <laughs> time, I don't use the word should at all. I don't use I'm going to take it out. I, li- mm-hmm. I think I think you should take that out because <laughs> seriously, absolutes and sexual health and fun. sexuality. Like, yes, that, that's. <laughs> The reality is, is that people aren't going to stop commute or touching or being involved with people for months at a time. That's not healthy. That's not even going mm-hmm. to work. It's not practical. Like, so if we're not helping people make some decisions about, okay, what is going to be like, how are we going to mitigate our risk in, as best as possible? Like, that's what we need to do is empower people to make the not decisions that feel good for them. Risk. If you're using should about yourself, then maybe you feel like. I don't know why you feel like it might not have been because these decision. are new things. These are new things. It's not like I had a boyfriend and I'm still trying to sleep with my boyfriend. I'm like letting just whatever I want to do every day. I do it, <laughs> I'm which I'm jealous. gonna do later. <laughs> I know. Don't be We're jealous. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's the thing. That's the reality. That's what folks are doing. And so you're yeah, you're doing just like true. I talked about earlier. You're taking a calculated risk because you want the benefit of what's going to come out of that interaction, mm-hmm. that like sexual experience. And so, <laughs> and hopefully it keeps paying out. You know, hopefully it keeps being beneficial. It's paid out every it. time so far. So like, I just feel like 
I'm on a I'm on a winning streak, so I'm just gonna mm-hmm, keep it mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Go with it. Exactly. You know, you mm-hmm. know what you need mm-hmm. and what your body needs, and that's all good. So, okay. So my story. So you said these stories could be about like relationships, dating, sex, something personal, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I alluded to this earlier because we were talking about this. This is the only thing I knew about the questions you might ask, you know, on the podcast. And I prefer not to know because I like it to be just as candid as possible. And so I usually don't have anybody like let me know what their questions are going to be. But but right before we started recording, of course, you were telling me that like we're going to talk about like a story. Do you have a story to share? So I had an idea in my mind, but then it almost came out as we were chatting because it was relevant. So if it, it sounds mm-hmm. like I was alluding to something and stopped myself, this is why. So All right. So yes, I have herpes. I have genital herpes HSV2 and I get regular outbreaks. I've also had HPV and I've also had scabies. So I've had multiple infections. Um, Oh, scabies is a good conversation. I have two stories, but and I meant to ask you about that. Do you want to hear about scabies or you want to hear about genital warts? Pick. I could tell Which you both. But That's a this or that. <laughs> scabies or genital warts? Are they both long? Because I kind of want to hear them both. <laughs> so Let me see if We'd I can never tell get okay. e- stories about either I might see one. If I, can, I might tell you. I, I and might neither of us are sharing. Me. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So which one do you want to hear first? Scabies. scabies. Mm-hmm. Okay. So scabies is a parasite. There are three different kinds of STIs, viral, bacterial, parasitic, and scabies is a parasite. Scabies is a tiny little microscopic bug that burrows underneath your skin, and the bug itself causes skin irritation, itches, and like a red spot on your skin. Then the bug defecates Mm. in your skin. That also causes irritation. And then the bug also lays eggs in your skin, and that also causes irritation. And so it is kind of gross, right? Because most people are really kind of irked out by bugs in general. And so even though I don't like to like try and say like stuff around STIs is gross. Scabies is kind of gross when you think about bugs under your skin and all the things that they yeah. do and all the things that are causing Laying eggs, this. defecating. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And there's a little trail, like you can see the trail that the bug has traveled on your skin and everything. And that's Through what's your itchy. skin? Now it's cure. Yes, yes. Like a little path on your skin and you can see all the little spots. Do they pick any part there. of your skin or this? this is like... So this is where, okay, so this is what's kind of interesting about, this is what's funny. So one of my exes, uh, um, we had first started dating um, and and actually he had, at the time, I had asked him, are you hooking up with anybody else? I'd had the conversation like, are we being exclusive? I just want to be like aware. Should I get tested? He knew I had herpes and he said, no, no, not hooking up with anybody else. So I start, we're, I start itching. Um, and it starts on my thighs and it's like just itchy and weird and a little bit of red rash. And I think like, I didn't know what I thought. I didn't know what it was. Like, it just seemed kind of benign, like not a big issue. And I really didn't know anything about scabies at that time. I really wasn't a, uh, I didn't do this work. I wasn't an STI educator. And mm-hmm. so it starts there and um, but then I like kind of let it go. And I think like it might pass. It's not, it, it might be an allergy. Like I'm having an allergy to a new detergent or something that I'm eating. Like who knows what this is anyways. So like a week or two goes by and it's on my arms now all of a sudden, you know, cause it keeps mm-hmm. traveling around your skin and your body and things. And if you let yeah. it go long enough, it'll cover your entire body ostensibly. And so I'm sitting at work. I was an accountant at the time and I'm sitting at work and I'm walking up to the people that I work with in the accounting office and I'm like what do you think this is like I've had this forever it's not going away and I'm like showing them my arm I'm showing them my scabies (laughs) Mm -hmm. but at the time I had no idea that's what it was finally I go into the doctor because I'm like this just isn't going away it's itchy it's irritating it's spreading what is this? And sure enough, it's another STI on top of one that I already have. And I'm like, what the actual F is going on? I literally just told everybody I work with about this rash that I have on my body. So now they're going to want to know. They're going to want to know what my results were because I told them I'm going to finally go to the doctor. Like, it's well, it's not going away. I put like, you know, antibiotic cream on it, hydrocortisone cream. I tried all these random things. I switched my detergent. I mean, this was a few weeks in duration where it had spread throughout my entire body and I'm showing everyone at work. You didn't told so, everybody. You're like, look, girl. <laughs> I, I did. I told everyone. I, I did, had no idea that this could manifest in this way. And at this point, it was on my arms, right? So it started on the thighs, but like at this point, it had already gone into other parts. 
parts of the body. So an STI just did not occur to me whatsoever. So anyways, I did, I did end up like confronting um, my partner at the time. And, you know, he was not just exclusively hooking up with me, of course. And, you know, like it was horrible. Like at, I was so super mad, super frustrated. I'm like, I already have one infection. I had a conversation with you. I did my due mm. diligence. All you had to do was be honest and direct. And then at least I wouldn't be like taken off guard and feel betrayed. And oh, whatever. so he knew he had it. He knew that. Well, no, he was he was having sex with other people he didn't know that he he knew he had something going on and Mm -hmm. um like basically he got it right around the same time that i did he gave it to me but um because he was the only partner i had he had multiple partners and then he knew like yep okay it started on my thighs too and it spread Mm -hmm. and it isn't going away and so i called him and said well you have scabies you gave it to me and now you have to go get cream and it goes away really fast you you put like cream on your whole body like super sticky thick cream and then you have to wash all your sheets and stuff because it's like a little bug it can be transmitted um and it can be on surfaces or on like um soft tissues or like clothes clothing and stuff Mm -hmm. like that so yeah so i had this bug in my skin and like horrible heebie-jeebies like grosses you out (laughs) but luckily it's temporary and goes away scabies interestingly enough can also be transmitted and this is somewhat common um is one of the stis that you see in like daycare centers or Mm -hmm. amongst like child care providers and stuff because it's a skin-to-skin transmitted infection so if it's in Mm -hmm. children it's usually not sexually transmitted at that point in time it's just because Mm -hmm. it's a close contact kind of thing but in adults it's almost always sexually transmitted in this circumstance it was so yeah that was my um third sti that i'd had at that point so genital warts (laughs) (laughs) yes and the bug thing is what's kind of gross about it like when you think about the whole like how it all works and everything i like Mm -hmm. bugs like i love spiders and all sorts of like creepy crawly things and whatever but even that was like ew not those scabies though girl no (laughs) No. i don't need one living in my skin like not in that kind of way like not that's gonna bother me we have bugs that live in our eyebrows you know we have we have a lot of like um, simpatico relationship. The way I turned to look like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't if know you, that? If you go down YouTube, if you get in a black hole on YouTube and you start looking at all the bugs that crawl on you and you're sleeping that you really can't see and, and they're, they're in your mouth and you'll go crazy. Don't watch mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So earlier Genital you warts. Asked, Genital warts. So earlier you asked if I had ever had a partner who had herpes and I had never had a partner who had herpes um, or at least that I was aware of or that they knew and, um, that we had that conversation, at least in that regard. But I have had a partner who's had genital warts, which is HPV, the low risk kind, the low risk strains are the ones that cause genital warts. And um, this was before we had hooked up, we were we had started dating, we had made out like, had a little hand action, like nothing like serious whatsoever. But I definitely wanted to go there. Like I super very much wanted to fuck this person. And I was like, yes, this Mm -hmm. is I, I, I want this very badly. And was very much into him and I had told my best friend at the time too I was like I'm I'm we're gonna have sex like I want to have sex with him and that's gonna happen the next time I see him Mm -hmm. I already know and we had only seen each other a couple of times at this point in time but I was like I can't even wait like that is not gonna happen and I don't even care if it's first date second date whatever like that is not a thing so he and I was already doing this work I was already working er as an STI educator and advocate and running the STI project. And he'd sent me a message and said like, Hey, I have something I wanted to talk to you about. I have genital warts. And immediately I thought, Oh fuck. Like I already have one (laughs) long-term infection that causes like a, a, like a a physical unsightly kind of thing. Like nobody wants blisters Mm -hmm. of any kind. That sounds icky, you know? And so Mm -hmm. because I get active outbreaks, I'm like, I already have this forever infection that causes small blisters on my body like Mm -hmm. oh how much do I really want to do this with this person like (laughs) oh you know I had to go through this like Mm -hmm. process and and simultaneously I'm like I'm this educator advocate so they're Mm -hmm. telling me with the assumption that probably that of all people I'm going to be the most receptive and open about it you know I'm going to be the most cool or at least the most like 
nonplussed by this disclosure of this information. And and he was getting like active warts and had had them treated and then they were coming back. And so they weren't going away at that point in time. And warts are like long term. They're not forever, but they can last up to four years. They say like six months to two years. Most people clear them. Um, but it, But this person ended up having them for like three to four years. So anyhow, even after getting them like burnt off or like, um, you know, frozen off, you can get them like cauterized, you know, and go into the doctor and have that and have that done. But that's still the virus is still in your system. And so they can still then populate and come out again. Mm -hmm. So I did. I had to go through this giant mental process of how much do I want to have sex right now with this person? How much am I into this person? Can I wait for somebody else? Like, can I just enjoy myself? And I masturbate and enjoy that and whatever. And I'm cool with Mm -hmm. it and whatever. But I also wanted definitely want to have sex with this person so i ended up deciding to and um and it was sex is some of so the best sex. hard to say no to <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Well, not only that, because it is truly a drug. I mean, once you get into that point in a relationship, your mind is creating different kinds of drugs that are not happening on a regular basis and your decision making changes quite a bit. And and this is mm-hmm. kind of one day we'll have to talk mm-hmm. about the disgust factor in psychology. There's there's a there's a factor of disgust. And so like you can Google the psychological disgust factor and that changes. This is why like parents, moms can get puked on and clean up poopy diapers and whatever. It's because Mm -hmm. you love that individual. There's this bond and that's intentional so that we can care for people. Like you can care for a dying um, parent and, you know, do the same kinds of things that you would do for a baby. Similar things happen when we start engaging in sexual activity or intimate relationships with partners. Our disgust factor goes down. And so things that we normally would think like, ooh, that might be bad, um, you know, that are that are good for us in terms of like uh, this is this helps us to stay safe in our life is is to avoid things that might be risky. All of a sudden that changes and our disgust factor and our level goes down. So we're not as worried mm-hmm. about it because we're into whatever is going to happen and we're creating a bond and whatever. So, yeah, the chemicals in our mind changes and everything. And I made that decision, but I don't regret it. It was actually really lovely. Um, as far as I know, I didn't end up contracting any genital warts. I didn't have any physical signs or symptoms. I might mm-hmm. have had the HPV virus for a while, but I didn't end up having any symptoms. But it was was definitely something that I had to talk to my best friend about and I was like girl I don't even know like I already have one infection like mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. I'm supposed really. to be cool about this but the disclosure was via text message so that's kind of another thing about having that disclosure conversation is that some people will tell you like oh you have to do it face to face and sit down and have this like thoughtful conversation with someone mm-hmm. and I don't think that that suits all personality types and people some and people might just safe. be like hey I have herpes are you cool with it or not <laughs> yes, exactly. And for me, I loved that it was via text message because I got to chew on it for a second and not have that immediate, like I didn't have to immediately respond. I wasn't worried about, uh oh, am I making a face? Because I shouldn't be making a face because I'm educated and empowered about this stuff and informed. Mm-hmm. But really, I'm thinking, how many more infections do I really want in my whole life? And how many, mm-hmm. and what if this doesn't work? What if I'm not going to be with this person for a long term? Mm-hmm. And this is just a temporary thing. Now I have two infections to disclose that that have like symptoms of not necessarily delightful they're not you know Mm -hmm. what anybody wants necessarily so anyways yes so i've had the experiences of the infections like who says that janelle i just want to say thank you yeah thank you so much for sharing your story for sharing your whole real raw story you know that is what this whole show is based off of. Like sex is great. Wet pussies are amazing. Big dicks are even better. Mm. But it's not every day that you get someone who is so open about their STDs and has an anniversary for them. Um, I appreciate you. I think it's dope what you're doing to try and break that stigma. Um, if there is anything you want to plug right now, if you, where can our listeners find you? I know a lot of people are probably going to hit you up like, ah, I need to tell my boyfriend. I, I feel like a lot of people are really going to come to you and be like, wow, this is great that you do this. Or can you help me through what I'm going through? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I get 10 to 12 to 20 
10 to 12. I don't know why that number came up, but <laughs> 10, <laughs> 10 to 12 um, messages every day on each of my platforms. So I'm at the STI project on everything, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. So at the STI project and then also the STI project.com. And then I offer consultations. So if you want to talk to me one on one, that's for a fee. But I have tons of free stuff as well on all of those platforms, lots of information, lots of resources. So if the fee is not accessible, then please, um, you know, scroll through my highlights. I answer a lot of questions for people all the time. But I'll do like a one-on-one consultation. Then I'm also launching a masterclass, which is an eight-week course to help people kind of get to this point of we don't give any more Fs about the stigma and it's not impacting Mm -hmm. us and how to walk through and unpack. And um, yeah, so that's a whole giant course that's offered and that's going to be launched in the next month or so. And yeah, Mm -hmm. but any time that anyone wants to reach out and see what I'm up to, like I said, I do a lot of stuff that's just off the cuff and intentionally free and resources that are available for everyone all the time. That's great. Well, thank you so much again. Um, I hope that you guys reach out to her. If you have any questions, if you need any help or guidance or just need somebody who you know can relate, uh, please reach out to her. And if you guys want to send us emails about your cocktails, send them to cocktails.acl at gmail.com. If you'd like some advice on possibly a future episode, send it to ask cocktails at gmail.com and then make sure you're following us online um on instagram we are at cocktails podcast i'm at kiki said so and i'm at coffee bean and until next week you guys goodbye. goodbye